The first reading is taken from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, verses 7 to 13, and can be found on page 361 of your Pew Bibles. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled for forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come visit your people, we pray. May we open our ears to hear your voice speaking to us this day. And give us strength and courage to do what you ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our series looking at hearing from God. And this is... Particularly if you're looking at that first reading which Jill, Jill read for us, which is such an amazing passage about Elijah the prophet. But before we get into explaining what's going on or exploring that this morning, I just want to ask you to ask yourself whether you've ever been disappointed by God. It's a difficult question to ask because... As Christians, the proper answer is no. But probably the real answer is yes. We believe in a God who is all love, who has created everything, from the most beautiful sunset to butterflies' wings. But also, we live in a world which is so broken and so far from what we want it to be and where it needs to be. And we live in in between those two poles. A God who is so good and magnificent and beautiful, who is worthy to be of all our praise. But then the reality of life, which is hard and difficult and painful at times. And we wonder, God, why don't you seem to be doing more? Why don't you seem to be answering my prayers? There are times in in my life when I've really struggled. I knew that God wanted to do something, but it seemed to take an awful long time to happen. And maybe it was my fault. Maybe I needed to pray more. If I had more faith, then things would happen quicker. If I fasted, if I did something, maybe that would twist his arm, perhaps, and make things happen. Or maybe 
as that song we sang earlier on, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord, maybe there's actually a blessing sometimes in the waiting. Maybe sometimes there's a blessing in things not being the way they need to be. And that perhaps through the difficulties and trials of life, we actually learn more than if things are always given to us. As parents, our children constantly ask things of us, particularly to my girls' ages. Can I have, can I have, can I have? <clears throat> and sometimes there's a real joy in saying, yes, here you are, in meeting their immediate needs. But there are also times when as parents you think, no, I gave you a sweet five minutes ago, you really don't need another one now. And so they need to learn to wait. But as human beings, we sometimes we get caught up in, he gave, he answered my prayer five minutes ago, Lord, why don't you seem to be answering it now? It raises all sorts of questions for us. And sometimes in life, we can end up being really disappointed with God. And sometimes that disappointment, it runs deep. God, why didn't you change that situation? Why didn't that prayer ever seem to be heard? And some of those questions we won't know the full answers to until we see him face to face and he can tell us himself. Elijah the Tishbite in the Old Testament is just a remarkable character. I don't know who, what kind of guy you have in your mind's eye when you think about Elijah, but I think of some wild-haired, heavily bearded, wide-eyed zealot for God who is, his ministry is to the northern kingdom of Israel. The Jewish people have been split. Israel in the north, the ten tribes, Judah in the south. And the northern kingdom was a terrible place to be right from the very beginning when the, the nation split. The, na- the kings led the people of Australia away from the worship of God. And Elijah was given the task of ministering to those ten rebellious northern tribes. Not an easy ministry to have. People who didn't want to hear, but still calling out, saying, God is still real. He's still a covenant God. He still calls you by name. If only you would hear his voice and come back. He would forgive your sins and heal your land. So that's Elijah's task. What's made more difficult is who's on the throne. King Ahab. Ahab has absolutely no regard for God at all. No interest in following the laws and traditions of of his father's forefathers. And he's married to a Phoenician princess, Jezebel. A name that's gone down synonymous in history with an evil, scheming woman. Jezebel is determined to bring about the whole-scale national worship of her god, Baal. Baal is the, the god of, of, of harvest, but also thunder and lightning. And she wants everybody to worship Baal and not to worship God. And just before the passage that we had read, there had been this big showdown on the top of Mount Carmel. There were the 400 prophets of Baal, and there was Elijah. Elijah sets up the contest. He says, let's make an offering. We'll put the, the meat on the altar and we'll pray for fire to come from heaven to consume the offering. Who's, whoever's God answers the prayer will know that's the real God. Baal, prophets, you have the ball. And all day long they're dancing, they're shouting, they're singing, they're whipping themselves, they're cutting themselves, whipping themselves up into a frenzy. Baal, send fire. And Elijah's having a little bit of fun. Maybe he's, maybe he's asleep. Or maybe he's on the loo. Try a little bit harder. In the end, exhausted, they give up. And Elijah says, now it's my turn. And he kneels and he prays. God, send your fire. The fire comes from heaven and it burns not only the meat, it burns up the whole altar and and licks the grass around it. A demonstration 
in front of all people, God is God. And Baal is an idol. In response, the people turn on the prophets of Baal, 400 of them, and they're all slaughtered. Elijah has won. It seems to be that he's been vindicated in front of the whole nation. That God is real. God answers prayer. When Queen Jezebel hears about what has happened, and by implication to her national policy of bringing about Baal worship everywhere, she utters a threat that before the day is ended, Elijah will be killed. Elijah has seen this amazing victory of God. This amazing display of God's power. And what does he do? And this is what I love about the Bible, because the heroes of the Bible are always flawed. I know I'm flawed. I'm not saying I'm a hero, but I'm definitely flawed, so I can relate. Elijah has seen what God can do, and he's been instrumental in actually bringing it about. But here's the threat of the queen, and runs. He runs out of Israel, down into Judah, and he doesn't stop running. He runs all the whole length of Judah till he gets to Beersheba, which is the southernmost city. And then he carries on running. He runs a day's journey into the desert where he stops. There an angel appears to him and gives him food and says, go to the Mount of God, to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. So carry on your running, Elijah. And probably quite thankfully he does. Probably a 20-day journey down into the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. There he finally stops on the mountain. What God does next is quite extraordinary. Elijah is asked the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I've been zealous for, the, for, for you, God. I've been doing everything that you want me to. I've been trying to win your people back. But all the prophets have been killed. And I'm the only one left. I'm scared. I'm the only one left. I, what, what can you expect me to do, God? Are you going to let me be killed as well? How does that serve any purpose? So God says, <clears throat> I'm going to pass by in front of you. So, there is a mighty wind which breaks the rocks apart. But God is not in the wind. There's an earthquake which shakes the mountain. But God is not in the earthquake. There's fire. But God is not in fire. Then there's a still, small voice. Elijah, what are you doing here? And he said, I've been zealous for you, Lord, and all the prophets have been killed and I'm the only one left. And God says to him, go and anoint three people. Hazael, the king of Syria, who will attack the northern kingdom. Jehu, the general, who will become king after a palace coup and overthrow Ahab. And Elisha, who will be your successor as a prophet to the nation. Oh, and by the way, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Sometimes in our disappointment with God, we forget how good he is. Sometimes we allow the emotions and the circumstances to distort our vision and perspective of who God really is. God does care intimately about every aspect of our lives. He cares about the things that we're interested in, the things that we care about. He is interested in, in the difficulties that we're struggling with. And he has promised to help. But often, just as 
A parent wants their child to, to learn responsibility and maturity. So sometimes God allows things in our lives which will grow us. And one writer put it, pain is the gift that nobody ever has. But it's still a gift. We can learn a lot through pain as well as through triumph. When I was a, a vicar in my first post, there was one afternoon I was trying to write a sermon and it just wasn't coming together. I was feeling really quite low and despondent about what was happening. And I decided, right, I'm going to go for a walk. The vicarage is right on the edge of a, of a forest. And I got up and I started walking and said, Lord, I'm not going to stop walking until I get a feeling of how much you love me. Because that's what's going to sustain me and hopefully get this sermon finished. So off I sat, walking through the forest. And I keep walking. And I keep walking. Lord, I'm going to keep walking until I feel how much you love me. And I keep walking. And I keep walking. Eventually it's getting dark. And I'm determined to keep walking. When all of a sudden I get a picture of the cross of Jesus. A vivid picture of a lurid sunset sky and Jesus in agony on the cross. And my reaction was, Lord, I don't want that. I want to know how much you love me. What I wanted was a warm, fuzzy glow. Just something, a little hand around the shoulder, oh, you're okay, you're really mad. But then it hit me. Be careful what you ask for with God. But then it hit me, that's how much he loves me. There is no greater love than someone who lays down their life for their friend. And by showing that picture of his own death, Jesus was showing me, Matt, this is how much I love you. Stop moaning and get on with your sermon. <clears throat> but it, it inspired me. It filled me afresh with that new vision of who God really is. It expounded my, my perspective, my understanding of who he is. For Elijah, perhaps when he saw the earthquake, the wind and the fire, Maybe secretly, that's what he wanted. He wanted those things. To fall on Ahab and Jezebel and the whole lot of them. Maybe he wanted that divine retribution and revenge. But God wasn't in the earthquake, the wind or the fire. Instead, he gets a still, small voice. When God speaks, sometimes it is dramatically but oftentimes it's very quiet. It's very gentle. It's very caring. It's very loving. But that voice has authority. When I was looking for a job after the prison service, I had been applying and looking for various things and nothing was working out. Then one morning, a voice said to me, look at Winchester. I'd not looked at Winchester, I'd not kind of thought about Winchester at all. Looked on the Winchester Diocese, and there was a job going for a, a parish, Bentley, Binstead and Froyle. And all of a sudden, that was the start of my process for being here. That little, still, small voice. For me, it's part of the confirmation that this is where God wants me to be, because he directed me here. When God speaks, often it is not what we expect. In fact, that's perhaps one way of actually telling whether that it is God speaking. If you take yourself into somewhere quiet, a little bit of wilderness, a little bit of countryside, or a, or a friendly mountain if you can find it, like Elijah, and you ask God to speak, if the answer you get is something which you wouldn't normally have thought of, then perhaps that is God actually speaking. 
because that's how he usually seems to work. If you hear a voice that's something which you would normally think of, then perhaps you've had too much cheese. Because God is sovereign, he's the king, he's in control. And he does want us to grow. He does want us to learn and to mature and to become better disciples of him. And he does want to speak to us. God has fully revealed himself in Jesus and through the Bible which speaks of him. But he still speaks today to his people. And you don't have to wear a collar. You don't have to have gone through a special service and people laid hands on you or any qualification other than you know Jesus and he's your Lord. And you can ask him to speak and he will. For Elijah, he was put into a new perspective. He realised that he wasn't the only one left, that there were 7,000 others who were probably feeling very similar to him. That the regime that was so evil would be overthrown as a result of who he anointed afterwards. That this period of evil would be would have a limit. God sets bounds to evil. It seems to rule and reign and run rampant for a while until God says enough. And when we look at circumstances around our world today, and you think, Lord, where is the end of this? There will be a boundary, and God will say, enough. But we, his his people, must and should be praying for God to move in those situations. We must allow our hearts to be touched and moved with compassion to move us to pray. And when you're facing those dis- disappointments that we spoke of at the beginning in life, it's not because that God has stopped loving you. It's not because that he has suddenly become unhearing. But there is a bigger picture that we are unaware of. The 7,000 which Elijah didn't know of. And that God is in control. That he weaves things together. When I was a kid, I was probably about 13, um, my parents bought a, a poem which they hung up on the wall. And um, I memorised part of it. It's called The Weaver. Some of you may know it's not till the looms are silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hands as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. So today, may we hear that still, small voice. The voice of comfort voice of love, a voice of wisdom and direction, and the voice that we need to hear today to take the next step on our journey.